actually that easy. Cool. <laughs> I'm trying to write I'm trying to write to the people Good morning, hi. We are starting off the vlog with Egg Emma. I just wanna ease into this vlog very slowly because I'm already overwhelmed. There's a lot going on, so I thought we could just sit down and start the morning off. This man has also been a demon this morning. I just thought we could ease in with some reading updates because I wanna talk about this book so much because I've started the, I've started reading, you know, the Murakami journey in publication order. So I started with the first one, um, Hear the Wind Sing, which I got, oh, this is upside down. I'm already on page 58, which is more than halfway through um, Hear the Wind Sing, and then I'll read pinball it's mostly just like vibes but because murakami because it's like baby murakami the vibes are not that strong yet it seems a lot like our main character who we don't know the name of um is very much like the young murakami who like famously wrote these novels at his kitchen table um in any time he can find i think late at night after he was done his shifts at his and his wife's um like jazz, jazz bar. Our narrator begins with reflecting on the nature of writing, how hard it is to write, how he doesn't know how to write. And so we follow this 21 year old guy and hear the wind sing, who basically just goes to the bar every night and gets extremely drunk with his friend who's just called the rat and talks a lot of smack about women. Guys, we're only 58 pages in and there's already been at least four scenes or descriptions talking a little bit bizarrely about boobs and i know that's a signature that's a staple of murakami but it's it's starting out strong in his first in his first novel ever women in this book it's just it is it's bad it's not good for example <laughs> there's this really uncomfortable scene where our narrator just takes this girl home from the bar because she's like blacked out she can't really walk and he like takes her to her apartment but then he like puts her in bed undresses her and stays the night like sleeping beside her also naked and then she wakes up in the morning justifiably angry probably extremely scared because there's literally a naked stranger in her bed um who has undressed her while she's been blacked out and it's just treated like she's just kind of crazy for like not thanking him and it's just like this weird cataloging of women as like body parts none of the women none of the women have names in this book in my mind they're just distinguished by their weirdly described breast shapes um that murakami is so famous for so that's like how i remember them which is so unfortunate or just other just other questionable phrases like with women it's okay if they owe you but not if you owe them so yeah this book is just kind of meandering around this guy who goes to the bar picks up women doesn't talk about them very nicely um, and listens to music and doesn't know what he's doing with his life. One really good thing I can say is that I'm getting a lot of music, like the music thing in Murakami is so prevalent, even from the first book, which is really nice to see. So I've started, I've decided to start a playlist um, that's gonna mention every single thing, right, Kelsifer? Every single piece of music that Murakami mentions in his books. So I've started that playlist. Um, and I will, I can tell you them now. We have Rainy Night in Georgia by Brooke Benton, which I love. We have Who'll Stop the Rain by Creedence Clearwater Revival. Also love that song so much. We have California Girls by The Beach Boys. We have Piano Concerto Number no. 3 and C Minor by Beethoven. We have A Gal in Calico by Miles Davis. And then finally, they did also mention so far Bob Dylan's whole album, um, Nashville Skyline. So I just added 
the first song, which was Nashville Skyline, rag to the playlist. Okay, he also goes through like brief summaries of all the girls he's either slept with or dated. Um, and for this one, it just says the third girl I slept with like to call my mm -hmm, her reason for being. Of course she did. I'm really sure she did. Okay, we have more songs mentioned. We have Everyday People. I actually don't know who that's by. Maybe it's Sly and the Family Stone. Oh yeah, that sounds like a Murakami show. We have Woodstock, Spirit in the Sky, and Hey There Lonely Girl. Okay, I'm gonna add these. What? <laughs> what do girls eat to stay alive anyway? Oh, your soul. I'd like to eat your soul, honestly. Chapter 26. Now I'm going to tell you about the third girl I ever slept with. She was 14 then, and it was the most beautiful moment in her 21 years on this planet. No. Okay, so I just finished Hear the Wind Sing, which was the first one, and it ended... And it ended with a quote from Nietzsche. Um, oops. Which was cool. Yeah, I don't know. So the first one was only 100 pages, and then um, Pinball is 130, so I think I'm just gonna start Pinball in a bit. I'll start it later today, but... Um, I liked Hear the Wind Sing, didn't love it. I got a lot of good... I got a lot of good song recommendations, though, so that was nice, but... Um, yeah, I did. I finished Murakami's first novel, which was really cool. Welcome back! No, no, this isn't welcome back because I've already started vlogging. I've like lost track of time. So today is Monday. I just wolfed down my breakfast really quickly because I was really hungry and now I just kind of feel... Here's, here's the situation with... I'm getting heat stroke right now. I feel like I'm either about to vomit, have a panic attack, or just overheat and blow up. That's kind of where I'm at this morning. Do I need to throw up right now? No, Emma don't. No, there's no reason to puke right now. Okay, I feel so unwell. Let's calm down. Let's not have a panic attack together. I did this method on the plane when I was flying because I get so much travel anxiety, it's unreal, but you breathe in, so you inhale and then you hold it for four and then you exhale four seconds and then you hold the exhale for four seconds, which is probably the hardest part. <clears throat> okay, we're going to the closet together. Do you wanna come to the closet with me? I know there's an anxiety cat at my door. Oh, Kelsifer, that makes two of us. Let's let him in. I thought he was going to sleep, but he's not sleeping. If I open this door, I know 100% what I'm about to see. Whoa, what a surprise. <laughs> Nowhere is safe from the landscapers. They want to landscape everything. Welcome to Monday. As you can tell, I'm in a bit of just... There's a lot going up. There's a lot going up. 
there's a lot going on up here um yeah but that breathing technique super super helpful second thing look at this shirt that lovely subscriber sent to me thank you so freaking much it's mushrooms a mushroom shirt i love it i'm obsessed i'm never gonna take it off i was gonna tell you my reading updates i might do that a little bit later in the vlog now because i think i'm about to go to my parents house today i don't know if we're going on a little day trip to a small town not too far away from here i don't know if that's today but i'm going to go visit because my mom just got back from alberta as well actually she was just in banff everyone's going to banff i would highly recommend i literally cried this weekend because i missed it so much um just the mountains anyway so i'm just gonna tell you the big huge life update now and then we'll talk about the rest of murakami and what i'm reading later um talking about it gives me a lot of anxiety this is gonna be a huge change for me you've already read the title of this video so you know what i'm talking about but you don't know where it is yet so yes i am moving i'm moving i'm leaving this apartment not only am i leaving this apartment um, I'm leaving my hometown. That's like the first time I've actually said that sentence out loud. Um, and that is insane. We're gonna go through it together. Like I have had a lot, I actually haven't had a lot of cries. I've had one cry and it, don't get me wrong. Like, let me explain it. It's not because I, um, I'm not crying about leaving London. I live in London, Ontario right now because I don't love it here. I've always wanted to leave London, but it's the fact that I'm moving somewhere that I think if you know me and I'm trying to keep an open mind about everything, I'm really saying things in a not cohesive order. But the reason I'm moving is because my partner got a job, a new job. So he's just going to be switching jobs and the job is not here. It's in Toronto. So Obviously, I've only started mentioning my boyfriend, my partner, whatever you would like to call him recently in these videos, but as I've explained, we've been together for much longer than the few weeks I've been talking about him. Um, and we've actually known each other since uh, the ninth grade when we met each other. We met each other in um, English class, actually grade nine English class, which is really funny. I remember the first thing I remember about him was him doing like a book, book presentation on like, it might've been Percy Jackson or something don't remember the book. Moving to a city that I've like always told myself has been the place that I like hate the most, which is a mindset I'm trying to change, I'm trying to work on because I'm gonna be living there. We did find a place and that was the reason my content was kind of, um, not disappeared for a while, but I took a longer break after Banff because literally um, we found out and then we went to Banff and then the day, we had one day at home after Banff and then the next day we took the train to Toronto to go apartment hunting for three days, which was extremely stressful, but it ended very fruitfully, very nice. I'm very happy with the place we found. I think it's a great neighborhood. It's close to the lake, which is something that I kind of wanted. It's close to nature, which is really important. The nature that Toronto does have. So we won't be moving for about like a month, but yes, there's a lot to be done obviously. And I'm feeling very, I'm feeling excited, which I didn't actually expect of myself because obviously um, when I found out we were gonna be moving there, um, I was just like, oh man. But like, I am really excited about certain things. And if you are someone, if you're someone who loves living in cities, I would love to hear from you. Like what, what you love about living in big cities, like write me a love letter to cities, to a city um, because I, I wanted my next move to be literally <laughs> to a little cottage in the middle of nowhere maybe in the mountains now that I've seen them and I've fallen so in love with them. I'm very happy that I have someone I obviously like as much as I do and get along with as well as I do and blah, 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 mushy gushy stuff to move to somewhere that I didn't ever want to move to essentially. And I think that's the more important thing. But yeah, there's gonna be a lot of big changes. If you are someone who's an introvert and does not like big cities and lives in them, what are your coping mechanisms? How do you do it? How are you doing? Um, I'm gonna be one of you very soon and yeah, so there's just a ton going on around here. You can't see, but we already have a bunch of boxes. So that is the big news. I'm so scared, but also a little bit excited about certain things. Um, this is gonna be crazy. I've lived here, I've lived in the same town, the same city for 23 years now, almost 24 years. I'm so grateful that my job, which is YouTube, I can move it anywhere. And of course I am still doing school, but I'm doing it online and I did obviously look up and check everything and I can finish my degree wholly online, finish my bachelor's online, which is just amazing. So that's what I'll be doing next year. I've never left this city and London only has about 
Oh my god, I don't know how many people. Is it almost 400,000, I think? And Toronto, of course, has millions, which is gonna be a huge, huge change, a huge struggle, but I wanna start definitely like maybe some kind of diary, some kind of like, some kind of video diary. A city with like two or three million people is huge by Canadian standards. So that was the reason I had to film a huge book unhaul. That's the thing, oh my God, that was the thing. Because I think I'm only gonna be bringing three of my shelves with me and only two of the big ones. So I had to get rid of a whole bookshelf of books. Let me show you. Here it is. So this bookshelf is pretty much empty. A few of them obviously are gonna go to my parents' house for storage. And then um, you will see my unhaul video. I did film one. Those are the books I'm thinking of bringing with me. It was just too much of a hassle. And as well, the apartment that we found is a lot smaller. If you live in Toronto, please feel free in the comments to say like hi or to tell me places to go. Um, I don't know anyone in Toronto. I don't have any friends in Toronto. I am going to know no one. So it's going to be a completely new 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 thing um and i'm not good at making new friends i'm not even sure how you're supposed to do that anymore honestly so yes but anyway i think i'm gonna go to my parents now and then i am going to bring all my books there and i'll probably tell you my reading updates there and we can see evie evie needs some screen time evie is my family dog so my parents dog and i'm gonna miss her so much Okay, hi, so I'm back home now. I really did not get any filming done at my parents' house. I went on a nice dog walk with Evie. It was really nice to see her. Um, but I can finally tell you about Murakami's first two novels because you guys know I finished Hear the Wincing and then I did finish Pinball 1973. Was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. Even though, like, this is definitely not my favorite Murakami by far, there's so much that was just kind of like, eh, about this book. This was so compulsively readable. And I just finished it so quickly that I didn't even film any updates about the second book. So these two, Hear the Wind Sing and then Pinball, are both continuations following the lives of the two same characters. And I believe there's actually two more books. I think it's A Wild Sheep Chase, which is the next one. And then I think there's Dance, 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 which both um, follow the two same characters, right? We have our unnamed protagonist and then we have the man called The Rat, who is friends with our protagonist. So Pinball 1973 is set a few years later when he is, I think, graduated from college and he is working at a small business that he's kind of set up, which is a translation business. And so he translates things, um, I think, into Japanese. So readable in that like you can just sit down and read through the whole thing. Nothing particularly super interesting happens. There's not a ton of plot here. Like I said, it's just like very loose floating vibes even in like these tiny minuscule murakami like setting himself up moments um that you can kind of see him later being so great at even in this like this still made me want to go out and when i was out like when i was reading this book in the world and like going for walks or going to get groceries like i was like I, it was like influencing me and i was like finding magic or thinking about things in a different sort of way or just really appreciating the vibes of the day like the feeling do you know what i mean like murakami gets at that so well after that's why after dark is one of my favorite books because it just like made me want to go out 
and live in a huge city and appreciate everything and like talk to every stranger I came across. Um, so maybe for moving to Toronto or something, I need to reread After Dark. But like, even even in this one, this one made me do it too, which is like so impressive, I think, because it's just like a feeling. It's just like a loose, nebulous little jellyfish feeling. It's like this crazy attunement to like possibility or like things that are just a little bit out of place. For example, in Pinball, our protagonist becomes kind of obsessed with finding this one pinball machine that he played on years before at the bar. And he goes on this obsessive journey to find this pinball machine and he talks to all these people and eventually he comes across this huge warehouse full of pinball machines. And it's just like this really bizarre thing that is still, you know, it's reality, it could be reality, but like it's stuff like that. It's like something so intangible that's so hard to put into words, but like he manages to put it on the page. And then when I go out, and I'm thinking about this book and I'm thinking what our protagonist would like write down and I go to like the supermarket or go on a walk on the boardwalk when like the sun's setting. It's just like this ineffable thing that you want to capture that like just kind of makes you feel alive and like makes you appreciate life. Would I read this again? I don't know. Was it that beautiful? Nah. Did Pinball 1973 somehow talk way more about boobs than this one it did there was one that i just spat spat laughing oh there's maybe a couple so in pinball our protagonist lives with a set of twin sisters identical twins and they don't have names he can't distinguish them apart but basically they just live with him for the whole of this novel and they like they're like his maids and servants and they make him coffee and dinner every night and blah 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 um and it's just like kind of a weird relationship. He's talking about women who are on the pinball machines. We have Audrey Hepburn, Marilyn Monroe, stuff like that, each thrusting out her glorious breast from beneath diaphanous blouses and buttoned to the waist. Their colors would fade, but their breasts would retain their eternal beauty. What a bizarre thing to say. This book also made me want to drink beer so badly. Never in my life have I wanted to drink beer more than reading these two novels. It's insane because basically all our two guys do is go to the bar and get drunk and drink copious amounts of beer. But like Murakami just made beer sound so good and I don't like beer. I think on the whole, I gave this collection three and a half stars. I think I did like Pinball more than Hear the Wind Sing in the end. I just thought this one was a bit more well-written, more compact, cooler. I am done with his first novel and I've been doing some book shopping because finishing this, it almost to God put me in a reading slump because I was like, I want more vibes. Murakami has made me obsessed with finding the vibes. And this kind of happened after reading After Dark um, where I was like, I just want to read more Murakami. Um, so what did I do? I went on a bunch of websites last night and the day before and I ordered the next ones I need to read so that I can just have them when I want to pick them up. Um, I did mention I wanted to like read these along with you guys. So if you're reading Hear the Wind Sing or Pinball um, or any of them, please let me know. I would love to know your thoughts. It's just going to be a huge informal thing. Like there's going to be no timeline at all. Um, but yeah, I will let you know when I'm about to pick the next one up if that is what you would like. I did start a couple other books. I'm just, I'm really in a reading kick and I'm loving everything I'm reading. So I was deliberating picking up some something else because I just really wanted like more of this feeling. Um, just more of this feeling. Like I'm on a Murakami high right now and that's fantastic. And I didn't even like adore this with my whole heart, but I'm just obsessed. Anyway, in the meantime, I decided to start Hunter Hunter volume two. I did not want to read a book after Murakami that I wasn't gonna like. So yeah, I picked up volume two yesterday um, and I'm 120 pages through. So like I'm, I'm almost done, but um, yeah, this volume I'm not liking as much as the first for sure. I think the first one, they're still passing the Hunter examination, the test right now. I think the first one had like much more entertaining and a little bit better plotted and paced um, contests and rounds of the competition, if that makes sense. Whereas this one is a bit more like not as entertaining. Like one of their tasks was to make sushi. Um, and of course they don't know what sushi is because they don't, you know, they're not from Japan. They're not from the real world. I'm still really liking it. Still gonna give it four stars for sure, but definitely was more enamored with the first one. And I went, that was the thing. I was trying to find volume three because I wanna like continue my manga series and like actually make progress and like hopefully finish a few, but I could not find volume three anywhere for the life on me, not on chapters, not on thrift books, not on book depository, not on Amazon, like, it's gone. 
or is it? This one I am listening to on Audible and I'm really liking it. I was a little bit miffed at the beginning, but I've warmed up to it. And that is The Keeper of Night by Kylie Lee Baker. This one I got from Book of the Month. Um, I think in like November actually, um, but I started it and I'm I'm hooked. I have to say I'm hooked. It's young adult fantasy. I'm gonna follow Ren, who's part British Reaper and part Japanese Shinigami. So she works with taking the souls from people who are set to die. When the book opens, she's living in London, but like no one there. Everyone is just incredibly abusive to her. They're just always like, you don't belong here. We don't want you here. And she gets harassed endlessly. She's also like a couple centuries old. So they're kind of like not immortal beings, but pretty close. Um, so one night she accidentally releases her Shinigami powers, which um, the Reapers don't know that she has, and they would definitely punish her if, if they knew. So she decides to set out for Japan with her half-brother Nevin, who is like a literal cupcake he's a cinnamon roll angel um and they're very close anyway they go to japan and her uh goal her journey is to hunt down her mother who she's never met and also to become like a full shinigami like learn the ways learn her powers and enter into the service of the death god in japan which is different from the death god in um england i was not really hooked until we got to japan because the first little bit pacing like things just happened so incredibly quickly but um, I'm really liking it because I'm so enthralled with Japanese um, mythology, specifically the yokai or the different kinds of spirits and stuff. So fascinating. So um, yeah, honestly right now this is just really, really fun because she's been given a task to like hunt down some more troublesome yokai and end their lives and their careers. Yeah, honestly, having a blast. Having a blast. I'm going to put Mr. Murakami back on his Murakami shelf and then maybe we can organize um, that shelf into publication order so I know which one I'm gonna read next uh, Why would I think that would not be what would happen? Okay, there we go. So I've got it in order for the ones that I have um, So we've checked the first one off. I am shook doing this. I'm shook that he wrote the wind-up bird chronicle so early comparatively um, like there's a few more I'm missing here, but I thought this was like much later actually like maybe with up with killing commendatory But it's not um, and the wind of bird chronicle is just Probably maybe his best in my opinion, but um, yeah, that's how my Murakami shelf is coming along I am so tired today. I just woke up from a midday nap. I'm so, so tired these past few days. Kelsifer has been waking up in the middle of the night, waking me up. He's just kind of changing positions, snuggling up like really close to me or going on the pillow, like that rests above my head um, or down by my feet and it just wakes me up. And he's not been getting the zoomies in the middle of the night, so I haven't really been getting a full rest, so. Yes. I just cut up on some of my schoolwork outside on the balcony, which was nice, but I do have some reading updates, which I am excited about. So number one, um, I already finished what, I can't remember what I was saying about this. Oh yeah, I finished Hunter Hunter volume two. Um, I gave it four stars, but I definitely liked volume one more than this one. Although towards the end, I thought it did get a little bit better. So basically this one is just an extension of our kind of team now. So we have Gone. Oh no, someone said it's not pronounced Gone. Oh man, I just need to watch the anime. I'm forever gonna say gone in my head, I'm so sorry. Um, so we have him, who is our protagonist. We also have Liario, who apparently just wants to take the test because he wants to be rich, but deep down we all know he's a softie. I honestly really like Liario, he has a soft spot in my heart. We have Kuropika, who is trying to get revenge on the Phantom Troop, who is this like really scary, I think they're a mercenary group who like killed his whole family. And then probably my favorite character is Kalua. I just, I just really like Kalua. He's just a kid out here murdering people left, right, and center, and it's fun. I think I'm gonna slow down and stop reading so much because my June wrap-up is gonna be, it's just gonna be out of control. But I did make a lot more progress on The Keeper of Night. Yesterday was quite a bad day for me. I did not have a good day. I was not feeling super well mentally, physically spiritually so i got to page 250 i definitely have a love-hate relationship with this because i think the story is so cool and it deals with a lot of really cool themes but the writing it is her debut novel the writing is not super top tier a really specific complaint that i have is that 
so many of the characters, right? Because we have Ren, her half-brother Nevin, who is, like I was saying, the cinnamon roll man who doesn't want to be a reaper, he doesn't want to kill people, he doesn't want to hurt a fly. Um, and then we have Hiro, who is the guy, he is Shinigami, but he's also, or no, he's not Shinigami anymore because he got kind of demoted, but he is a fishing spirit. And Ren and him have a lot in common because they're both kind of outcasts from their world. Ren is now facing the fact that even now that she's in Japan and she wants to be a Shinigami, people in Japan are are still calling her a foreigner even though she was literally bullied, harassed, and abused for the exact same thing in London um, by her fellow reapers, so that's what's going on. But the specific complaint that I have is that uh, Nevin and Hiro just call, like their dialogue, like I want to say at least 60% of their dialogue is literally just saying Ren. Like the amount of times that people just say our main character's name as like a fill-in for dialogue, especially Nevin, all he seems to say is Ren. Ren question mark, Ren exclamation mark. Like just say something else, just say something else please. That's such a weird thing to have to say. The fact that it's come up so many times where they're just literally like, Ren, just say something else. Give us something else, you know? Don't just keep yelling at our protagonist. I don't think any of the characters are well fleshed out at all. They're very flat. Um, I don't really know a lot about Ren. Things happen very quickly in this book, especially at the start, like I was saying. But overall, like even with all those qualms, um, I'm still enjoying it, which, which is good. I've not really talked about my American Lit course, primarily because I'm not having fun with it. It's going fine. I'm getting good grades, although here's here's something I'm gonna complain about. My grades are fine, even though like, to be honest with you, like I'm just gonna be really honest, I'm not trying whatsoever. I'm putting in the least amount of effort possible and we've only had two essays so far that have been graded. So the last essay I wrote was on Emily Dickinson, a few of her poems and talking, what was I even talking about? Basic, that's a duck. Those are two ducks. How kind of America's narrative and promise for um, creating the individual. It's a place of like self-creation, a place to um, be who you are, be independent, find yourself. America as the nation of like creation, self-invention, that whole thing is obviously denied to huge groups of people. Um, and I was like exploring that in Emily Dickinson's poetry and what she was doing um, to try and explore herself in her own poetry because she couldn't really do that in the ways that her counterparts were doing in real life. So that's what I was talking about, but okay, so yeah, the thing I complain about. That essay got an 86, whatever, that's pretty great. That's phenomenal because I did not, no work was put into that, I'll tell you right now. Here's the thing that as a student I really don't like because like the feedback he, this professor, I mean, I've had some professors who don't give any feedback, which is a little bit frustrating, but this professor, like, there is, right? There's a ton of feedback. There's stuff that said, um, good point, I like the way you put this, that's interesting, good analysis, um, or just, like, a comment engaging with an idea I was talking about, like, having a conversation, which is also cool, but nowhere in this comment or feedback, nowhere is there something negative, nowhere is there something to work on, nowhere is there, like, that's an error, you shouldn't have said that, um, this wasn't enough, you could have pushed this a little bit further, like nowhere in the feedback or comments for that essay and for the one I did previously was there anything that, um, anything that I learned, which is frustrating, right? Because I feel like you know what you excel at, you know what you do well at, it's the, the areas that you're a little bit confused, maybe you're a little bit muddy on what you're doing wrong or what you could be doing better, that's where you need the feedback, that's where you need the help, and so when you receive none of that and the grade is an 86, of course like you still want to be happy with that grade, but you're like, okay, why is it an 86, why isn't, why wasn't it a 90, you know, what, what could have been better, um, is kind of where I was at, and that's honestly just kind of frustrating because it doesn't leave me with anything valuable to work on for the next essay. It leaves me with praise, but praise that I already knew I was doing well, because that's what I would do. You know what I mean? So, yeah. That's my little rant. That's my little rant ramble over that. And then the last thing I wanted to do, because I forgot to update when I was closing off um, Hear the Wind Sing, I wanted to tell you what other songs I found that I've added to the playlist. Um, because if you don't want to read the book, if you just want to know what songs I found. Everyday People by Sly and the Family Stone. I like that one. We have Woodstock by Matthew's Southern Comfort. I gotta be honest, I'm not a fan of this one yet. It could warm up, could warm up to it, but I'm not. We have Hey There, Lonely Girl by Eddie Holman. Love this one. I love this one. Um, I'll tell you if I've heard these before, but so far these ones I haven't. I love the song that I found, and it just... Ah, it just fits. I'm still thinking about Hear the Wind Sing and Pinball. 
I'm still thinking about it. Uh, we have Good Luck Charm by Elvis Presley. We have Haydn's Piano Sonata Number no. 32 in G minor. We have Hello, Mary Lou, Goodbye Heart by Ricky Nelson. I listen to Ricky Nelson every once in a while, but I've never heard Hello, Mary Lou. Love it. We have Rubber Ball by Bobby V, which is simultaneously super annoying, but also super catchy and fun. Uh, we have Penny Lane by The Beatles. We have It's So Peaceful in the Country by Mildred Bailey. I really like that one. We have Jumping with Symphony Sid by Stan Getz and Jimmy Rainey. We have Just Friends by Charlie Parker. Both of those I really like. Uh, we have MacArthur Park. I can't find the original on Spotify, so the one I have is by Glenn Campbell. I'm not a huge fan of this one, but again, could warm up to it. And then the last one we have that I found so far is Rainy Days and Mondays by The Carpenters, um, or just Carpenters. So yeah, those are the songs that I found if you're wondering, but I'm going to go now and I'll probably close off this vlog tonight because I imagine it's quite long. I'm gonna go put this back on my shelf. I think it's dead now. I don't know where it's going. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> We're educating the public, yeah. okay? Educate them. <laughs> educate yourself. <laughs> Stay educated. <laughs> no, we're talking about stuff. Josh no, I swear, you said it was the summer I've never read it. I've never read it. I've you never said you read it. it. <laughs> I've never read it. You have read it. No, was it your sister? Was no, it no. you? <laughs> I can freaking believe you. Bring sir. those receipts. I've never read it. <laughs> Never, never read it. The Goodreads receipts are coming out. I'm watching the slander. <laughs>